Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Charlie Hobson. Dr. Hobson is a professor of management here at the IU Northwest School of Business. He is uh, actively involved in our leadership and teamwork, team leadership course, courses here. And so I think we're in good hands to learn all about effective team leadership today. So Charlie, I'll <laughs> hand things off to you. Thank you, Gina. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for joining us for this workshop. Uh, I apologize that it's going to be one-way communication. I'm an old-fashioned guy and love to have the face-to-face -face interaction in a classroom or in a workshop setting, but that's not possible with this type of technology. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> like you, I am a small business owner. Uh, I've had my own business since 1983, uh, so I share many of the same concerns and challenges that you've worked with in the course of running your business. <clears throat> One of the biggest challenges that we have is leading teams. Uh, you get to the point with a small business, and I hope all of you are there and have moved beyond it, <clears throat> but you get to the point in any small business that there's so much work to do, you can't do it by yourself, even though you're, you're okay with working 12, 14 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, if you become successful, there is so much work that needs to be done, you have to start bringing people on board. And when you do that, you have a team. And when you do that, it is then critical uh, in terms of how you lead the team. So team leadership is critical to the success of any organization, but especially a small business. <clears throat> I've got a couple of topics today that we're going to talk about that I hope will provide you with some reinforcement for the things that you've been doing and some insights into hopefully things that you haven't been doing that you might start doing. The first topic I want to talk about today is leadership by example. Again, I wish I could solicit from you uh, instances when you've done this successfully, but we're going to talk about leadership by example, and I have an illustration that I hope will stick with you forever. When I first was exposed to this, it was shocking to me, and I've never forgotten it. It is, it's a compelling example of how successful leadership by example is. Uh, so let me start out by asking you, and again, I wish we could get some responses, but I'd ask you to think about the most difficult thing that you have to ask your staff members to do. <laughs> What's the most difficult thing? A lot of people will say, well, uh, Charlie, I hate to ask somebody to have to stay over uh, knowing that they have plans. Uh, but uh, if somebody calls off or there's a, ru a sudden rush of customers or we get a sudden rush of orders, I hate to have to ask somebody to stay over because I know it impacts their personal and their family lives. Uh, other other responses would be something like, you know, we have housekeeping chores in the business and I hate to have to ask one of my employees to, to engage in a housekeeping task. So those are distasteful. It's distasteful to have to ask somebody to do those kinds of things. But I'd ask you to reflect for a moment on what is the most difficult or challenging thing an army officer has to ask his soldiers or her soldiers to do. <clears throat> I'd ask you to just think about that for a moment. I was in the army for five and a half years, three and a half as an enlisted man and two as an officer. The information I'm gonna share with you comes from a book called Cohesion, the human element in combat. Again, I'll, I'll ask you to think about <clears throat> what the most challenging task would be for an army officer, an infantry officer. <clears throat> Again, I wish we could talk about it, but uh, I'll share with you what, what the answer is. 
the single most challenging thing for an infantry officer to ask his or her soldiers to do is to do something that both of the individuals know could get the soldier killed or wounded. Imagine how challenging that is. I'm going to direct you to do something and you need to do it immediately without question, without discussion. And you and I both know that you could be killed or you could be wounded. I would argue that that is one of the, the most significant ultimate challenges for a leader. Consequently, because of this challenging situation, <clears throat> the army, the military has studied leadership for many decades. And I believe we have some answers, some good answers to this question of how do you get somebody to do something that could get them killed or wounded? Ultimately, the answer, the, the primary answer is leadership by example. So let me, I'm going to, I'm not the most tech savvy guy in the face of the earth, but I'm going to try to share my screen with you. And let's see how this goes. Okay. Uh, fantastic technology works. What do you know? <clears throat> At the top here is the name of the book that I mentioned. It's called Cohesion, the Human Element in Combat. And in this book, they asked the question, <clears throat> what country has the best army in the world during the period of time I have on the, on the uh, screen from 1945 to 1985? So immediately after World War II until 1985, which country, and they looked at five in particular, the ones I have listed, which country had the best army. Now, many instances, people say, well, Charlie, how in the world do you measure an army's, and we're not talking Navy or Air Force, how do you measure an army's success? We have some fairly objective indicators. We can look at <clears throat> KIAs, killed in action. How many enemy soldiers were killed compared to how many of your soldiers were killed? We could look at wounded in action the same way. We can look at POWs, prisoners of war, the same way. We can look at territory taken or territory given up. Uh, these, these indicators that I'm mentioning are of particular relevance now with what is going on in Ukraine. And we get almost daily reports about uh, who's taken what territory, how many, casualty, how many casualties did they have, and so on. <clears throat> so they're, again, fairly objective indicators to determine which army won a conflict. So Jaina has assured me, she's our tech expert, she has assured me that she would be able to tally what your choices are. So there are five options, the United States, Russia, Israel, North Vietnam, and Argentina. And my question to the group is, which of those five do you think had the best army from 1945 to 1985? So if, you're, if you think it's the U.S., uh, send Jaina a U.S. If you think it was Russia, send USSR. If it's Israel, write that, type that to her. If it's North Vietnam, type that and send it to her. And if it's Argentina, the same way. So we'll give you a moment or two to think about your choice. Again, it's 1945 to 1985, best army, not Navy, not Air Force, not Marines, best army. And Gina's gonna tally up <clears throat> the responses and I'm gonna write them in as she gives them to me, and then I'll share with you what the answer was in the book. So, so go ahead and go into the Q&A, please. The Q&A, not the chat. Go into Q&A and just type your answer to me, please. Okay, thanks, Jana. Mm -hmm. 
without your tech savvy knowledge, I don't know what we do. <clears throat> So Gina, what, what do we have? Do we have any votes for the US? Well, answers are still coming in. Oh, still coming um, in. All right, then we'll, we'll take a moment. So, yeah, give me a minute. Sure. Um, US, Russia, kind of interesting. Israel, North Vietnam, and Argentina. <clears throat> Which of those, and in the military community, the, the answer is well established and well accepted. So one of these countries so, clearly has the best army. So we got a few responses. Um, okay. There were, everyone's, every country was selected except Argentina, but the one mm -hmm. with the most votes was USSR. Okay, so um, I'm gonna put most for USSR, some for US, some. Okay, so USSR and uh, North Vietnam are tied. USSR and North Vietnam are tied uh, for the most. Yes. Is that, is that accurate? Okay. Yes. <clears throat> and the, <clears throat> the votes have stopped coming in? <clears throat> Uh, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Let me make a couple of comments about the voting. <clears throat> First, uh, Argentina came in last in this analysis, so it's good that nobody voted for Argentina. Uh, <clears throat> I am a little disappointed that we didn't have more votes for the United States Army. As a veteran, that, that really tugs at my heartstrings. So, but at least we had some votes. I will note... <clears throat> As you move south in our country, and I ask this question at different, in different states, by the time I get to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, when I ask the same question, everybody votes for the US. Everybody votes for the US. So we have a tie with USSR and <coughs> Vietnam. And I'm thinking Russia gets some votes because of, of uh, their recent success with Ukraine. In fact, in the book, in the book, Israel comes out as number one, and we'll talk about why in a moment. Israel comes out as number one. Number two is North Vietnam, tied for third, the United States and Russia, and poor old Argentina was last. So <clears throat> let me explain why Israel was so successful, has been so successful, continues to be successful. And it's related to the notion of leadership by example. Before, before I share the findings with you, let's look in this, at this triangle off to the right. <clears throat> If we have an infantry unit with a hundred soldiers in it, anywhere from three to five of those soldiers would be officers, the formal leaders of the company. So we have a hundred infantry soldiers, three to five out of that 100 would be their officers. So this is an important figure to keep in mind when I share the results of this, this uh, book. So let me flip. And this is what I hope you will never forget. And I hope it stays with you and reinforces you for your use of leadership by example. <clears throat> so we just said that in the, in the Israeli army, in all armies, three to five percent of the soldiers are officers. <clears throat> Here are two wars that Israel fought against the surrounding Arab countries during the period from 1945 to 1985. During these two wars, almost 50%, almost 50% of the Israelis killed in action 
were officers, yet they make up only three to five percent of the fighting force. What does that tell you about Israeli officers when the going gets tough? It tells you that the Israeli officers are out at the front. <clears throat> They're leading from the front. In fact, in the Israeli army, <clears throat> they train from day one. If you're the officer or you're an NCO, non-commissioned officer, and you're in charge of a group, you're the leader of the group, you don't ask your soldiers to do anything that you wouldn't do. That's important. And the Israeli army goes a big step beyond that, that you wouldn't do and that you wouldn't do first. That's huge. So when we get in a dangerous situation, the Israeli officers are trained to do whatever needs to be done first and simply ask their soldiers to follow them. And remember the challenge that officers face. We're trying to get soldiers to do things that could get them killed. What we found is the most effective way to do that is for the leader to go first and ask his or her soldiers simply <clears throat> to follow. Stunning statistics. Almost half of those killed in action were officers, yet they make up only three to 5% of the fighting force. <clears throat> I'm confident all of you have used leadership by example before. I hope these statistics will reinforce in your mind how powerful this technique is. <clears throat> you're telling people, you're showing people, you're leading by example, you're saying, I will do whatever I'm asking you to do, and I'll do it first. So if there's a tedious task, <clears throat> an unpleasant task, <clears throat> it's always a powerful technique. If the leader will show, I'm not afraid to the old saying goes, I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. I can't do this all day. There are things that I have to do to lead the business, but I'm not afraid to get my hands dirty. And I hope as one of my employees, you will jump in and finish this task for me and not complain about it. Uh, again, uh, I think everybody has, has, if you're a successful small business owner, you've done this before many, many times. I'm gonna share an example, a very positive example from a, a friend and a colleague of mine. And I think if you live in Northwest Indiana, you're familiar with Strack and Van Teel supermarkets. <clears throat> One of the former owners, Sam Van Teel, <clears throat> an outstanding leader, is almost legendary within the company for the following instance of leadership by example. And this goes back decades. <clears throat> Sam was in the office in the Cherville store on a Saturday when he got a call from his manager in the deli. She said, Sam, <clears throat> I had a couple of call offs today. I just got two huge orders for fried chicken for parties that people are having. I don't know what to do. And you can imagine, I'm sure you can anticipate what Sam said. Sam, again, is a phenomenal human being and a phenomenal leader. He said, give me a minute, I'll be right down. So he had his business attire on, nice shirt, tie. Sam went down immediately to the deli, put the apron on and said, what do you want me to do? And she said, we need to start breading the chicken so we can put it in the fryer. And that's what Sam did in order, in order to ensure that we had the chicken when the customers came in. Uh, again, legendary in the, in the Strack and Van Teel chain, uh, indicative of the kind of leader that Sam has always been. He's willing to jump in wherever needed to, to serve the customer. Again, I wish we were interactive so I could ask you for some examples but I'm confident if you're a successful small business owner and you have a team, 
if you're not leading by example, I, I don't know how you could be successful ultimately. But hopefully this information from the book, Cohesion, the Human Element in Combat, hopefully this information will reinforce in your mind the value of leadership by example. Again, I wish I could ask if there are any questions, but with this particular format, uh, we don't have that option. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing. I will, I will offer, and Jaina is monitoring the anything that you type in. If you have any questions or you have an example of what we're talking about, uh, type it in for her and she will jump into the uh, presentation and, and uh, share it with the, the group. So that's uh, what I have to say about leadership by example. It's a powerful technique. It works even when the task your subordinates are required to do is something that is dangerous. The second topic that I'd like to speak about this afternoon is the two different types of leadership of teams. <clears throat> and we've done re research on this for many decades. There are two basic types of team leadership. The first is called task leadership where the focus is on getting the job done, whatever the job that needs to be done right now, the task leader is a person who makes sure we get the job done. <clears throat> so we have task leadership as the first type of team leadership. The second is what we call social leadership. And this is leadership that addresses the social and emotional needs of your team as individuals and as team members. So we have task leadership and we have social leadership. The social leader pays attention to how people are interacting together, how people are feeling today, how people are performing today. And what we found is <clears throat> truly effective leaders do both. They do task leadership, make sure we get the job done. They also do social leadership, address social leadership, and make sure everybody is feeling good and working well together. Now, as successful small business owners, I could conclude, I can conclude, that you have been doing a good job with task leadership, because if you weren't getting the job done, you wouldn't generate sales, you wouldn't be able to stay in business. So you are already providing task leadership where you wouldn't be here. You, you would have been out of business a long time ago. <clears throat> what we find with many small business owners and with many leaders in general is they tend to focus primarily on task leadership at the expense of social leadership. They become so focused on getting the job done, getting the orders out, serving the customer, that they forget about or minimize the importance of their individual workers. <clears throat> so I want to share an anecdote with you <clears throat> that illustrates how this can be done, how this was done, and how impactful it can be with your staff. <clears throat> this is an example from North American Van Lines, headquartered in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And it comes from, I go way back, it comes from the mid-1980s. We're doing a workshop with managers at North American Van Lines, and we were talking about how important it is for leaders to be supportive of employees when they experience personal or family challenges. So that you know your people well enough so that I know when there's a personal or family challenge, if I'm your leader, I can be supportive and I can be helpful. <clears throat> so I asked after we made the presentation, I said, are there any examples to illustrate what I'm talking about? 
and this is mid 80s, uh, 84, 85. <clears throat> and the, the young lady who raised her hand and shared this example, it was so moving, so compelling. I've never forgotten it. And I utilize it anytime we're talking about leadership and motivation. <laughs> she raised her hand and I called on her and she said, Charlie, I don't know if I can share my story with you because this is the first time I've spoken about it publicly. So I, I knew something serious was coming, but I said, do the best you can. And if you can't go forward, we'll look to someone else for an example. So she said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get myself together and I'm going to share this. <clears throat> so she said a couple of years before the workshop, uh, well, this is again, uh, mid 1980s. So a couple of years before that, she said uh, she worked at North American. Her husband worked at a, as a manager at a bank. They had two children, <clears throat> a three-year-old little boy and a one-year-old little girl. The little girl became sick with all kinds of unusual symptoms. They took her to, to doctors in the Fort Wayne area. Nobody had any idea what was going on. So they made a referral to Children's Memorial Hospital on the north side of Chicago. So she and her husband took the little one-year-old daughter up to the hospital. They did a series of tests over the course of a day. The lead physician called mom and dad in uh, at the end of the day and said, I've got some really bad news for you. Uh, your little girl has a very virulent form of childhood cancer. And right now there is no cure. Can you imagine how devastating that news is? We've done, and Jaina has helped with this, we've done research on stressful life events for adults. And worldwide, the single most stressful life event for adults is the death of a child. Nothing is more stressful. So the physician says, your little girl is dying, one year old, and you can't explain something to her because she, she wouldn't understand. She's dying, there's no cure. But he said, we have, a, we have a, an experimental program that we're testing at the hospital. It would require, it's an eight week program. <clears throat> it would require that your daughter be here all day Monday, all day Wednesday, all day Friday to receive these treatments. <clears throat> would you be interested in signing up? So what do you think mom and dad said? Uh, those of us with children, of course, of course, we have to sign up. So as they were driving back to Fort Wayne, she and her husband are saying, and this is in the days before Family Medical Leave Act, <clears throat> they're saying, how in the world are we going to be able to do this? Eight weeks, and you have to go up to Chicago the night before. It, the drive is too long to get up at two or three in the morning. So they said, geez, we don't know what we're going to do. So they decided that the mom was going to go talk to her boss about it at North American Van Lines and see what she could get from them. And then dad was going to talk to the bank. <clears throat> so mom went to the, her supervisor, explained in his office what was happening. And before she was able to ask for anything, again, she related this to the whole group. Before she was able to ask her anything, her supervisor interjected and said, I can't believe how crushing this news must be for you and your husband. I have kids, and if somebody told me one of my kids was dying, I would be devastated. My heart goes out to you. So he was empathizing uh, with her. He then said, here's what we're going to do. As soon as you leave the office, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get the other three managers at your same level in the organization. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask each of them to take one fourth of your workload. And I am going to take one fourth of your workload so that we're going to start doing your job as soon as you 
leave the office <clears throat> so that you continue to get paid because that's a huge issue if if she can't work there was no family medical leave act uh, how do we how do we uh, deal with the the loss of income so he said we'll start doing your job for you immediately and we will continue doing it until you are able to come back to work she said she was absolutely shocked at that response and humbled by that response in addition her manager said we will start a collection up at our headquarters site here in in the fort wayne to help offset the additional funds you're going to need for food lodging travel and so on and they were able to raise, and again, this is early 1980s, they were able to raise $10,000 that they presented to the family. Sadly, uh, mom took the little girl up to Chicago for those eight weeks. Uh, sadly, the treatment had no effect on the spread of the cancer. The little girl died within a month after completion of the, the treatments. Mom was obviously uh, devastated, uh, depressed, received uh, counseling, uh, uh, clinical assistance. So it was almost six months before she was able to schedule part-time work. I'll come in for a couple hours today and we'll see how it goes. And I'll come in a couple hours later in the week. It was almost six months before she was back to work full-time. And you can imagine what she had to say about her level of commitment, loyalty, and motivation with respect to her boss, her co-workers, and all of North American van lines. She said there isn't anything she wouldn't do for her boss, her co-workers, or North American van lines <clears throat> because they were there for her at the darkest time in her life. And they did more for her than she even dreamed of asking for. As you can imagine, there was a very positive spillover effect throughout the entire facility. Everybody who worked there felt that we helped her through this difficult time. And if something like this happened to me, I could count on my company, my coworkers, supporting me in the same way <clears throat> so that was part of the culture at north american van lines i am confident and again i wish we were able to be interactive but i am confident we have people in the audience who've done things like this for your employees we have a lot of flexibility as small business owners we're not bound by uh, typically union contracts or, or uh, state and federal regulations. So we have a lot of flexibility. And some of the most compelling examples of this have come from small business owners. And they say they create a climate in the organization where people feel valued, people fear, feel cared for, and that motivates them to come to work, motivates them to, to do a good job, and motivates them not to quit. So right now, businesses of all sizes, especially small businesses, are grappling with how to find good employees, how to keep good employees. What I just mentioned as a strategy can help eliminate turnover. People are so appreciative when you do these kinds of things for them. Coworkers are so appreciative that that helps bind them to your <clears throat> organization. It reduces the likelihood that they will quit and go take a job someplace else. So I highly recommend, maybe you can't give somebody six months off, but anything that you can do to show that I care about you, I care about your family, I want to support you, I'm understanding, I'm empathetic. Anything that you can do along those lines will significantly enhance a person's engagement with your organization and reduce the likelihood that they will think about quitting. I'll give you a bad example. I'll give you a bad example. And this was from a small business in Northwest Indiana 
And I'll just leave it at that. This was shared by a manager in a workshop. This particular company, if you can imagine this, and this is probably 15 years ago, this particular company did not have bereavement leave. It's a small company. They had no bereavement leave. So if somebody, a, a, a close member in your family died, you had to go in and, and either take vacation time or plead with the owner to, to let you have some time to go to the funeral or, or go to the wake. <clears throat> so this young man said <clears throat> that this, this particular owner was during the, their busy season, which was winter time. He went in and told the owner, my grandfather raised me and my grandfather died earlier this week. I'm going to go to the wake tonight, but I would like to go to the funeral tomorrow morning. And I was stunned to hear the response from the small business owner. He said, you know, we don't have a bereavement leave policy. There is no bereavement leave. And you know, we don't let people take time off during our busy season. So the answer is no. And if you don't show up tomorrow morning, you'll be fired. What kind of a response was that? You can imagine, well, I'll ask you, what do you think, what do you think that young man did? What would you do? Uh, I, I think the answer is fairly obvious. He went to the funeral and he was fired. And everybody else in the facility found out about it almost immediately. And everybody started looking for another job. Who wants to work with someone with a black hole where his heart was supposed to be? So it, if you're not caring, if you're not empathetic, if you're not supportive, it will make it very difficult to attract quality people, retain quality people, motivate people to work for you. So I know you're task oriented. You have a task leadership or you wouldn't be in business. <clears throat> I would just suggest that you pay more attention it's, a, it's a, a shortcoming of all, of all of us as small business owners. Try to pay more attention to the personal and social needs of your employees, and it will pay huge dividends in the future. I have, I'm going to close with an example of a leader that we had at Indiana University who was a phenomenal task leader and at the same time was a phenomenal social leader. She was one of a kind. <clears throat> I don't know if any of you knew her or worked with her. Her name was Peggy Elliott. She was our chancellor for several years. Her, her doctorate was in education, so she was absolutely the task leader on our, on our campus, ensuring that we had high quality educational programs and that they were delivered in a, in a high quality manner to our students. In addition, she was our hands down social leader. And there were a couple of things that she did. Again, I, I never forget it. It was so shocking to me. I never forget it. This was back years ago and Peggy would carry with her a dictaphone and in her meetings and interaction with people outside the university, if anybody ever said that, hey, you know, Jaina, I, I did some, I had some interaction with Jaina Zostek in your, in your Center for Professional Development and, and she's really doing a great job. Peggy would make a mental note of that and record a message on her dictaphone to Jaina about what she did well. Peggy, at the end of the day, would take the tape out from her dictaphone and give it to her secretary, Laverne, and ask Laverne to type up individual messages to all of the employees mentioned in the dictaphone. <clears throat> Peggy would personally sign Peg to each one of them, and they'd be sent out. I asked Laverne 
how many, is this a, a once a week, twice a week? And she said, Charlie, Peggy does 10 to 15 of these daily. So Peggy was paying attention to <clears throat> compliments about her staff and she personally recognized them. Amazing, amazing. 10 to 15 on a daily basis. The other thing about Peggy that I never forgot, we had about 200 employees at the time and we would have a summer picnic. And I, was, I would marvel at this. We had a picnic tables spread out. They're serving the food. And Peggy would begin at one end of the set of tables and go to every table and greet employees by name, spouses by name, and children by name. Everybody, the whole group, from the custodian right up to the assistant vice chancellor. She knew the names of the employees. She knew the names, if they were married, of their spouses. And if they had kids, she knew the names of their kids. Again, I talked to Laverne. Laverne said Peggy had a, a, a folder for each employee. And anytime uh, there's a birth, that she hears of a birth or something, she would make note of it, put it in the folder. And she would review the folders before she went to the picnic and had a phenomenal memory and could, and, and I would just sit with my mouth dropped when she would get to my table, she'd say, Charlie, how are you doing? Gabby, you're looking great. And little Josh and little Natalie, you guys are really growing up fast. And I'm thinking, how in the world does she do this? She did it because it was important to her to be a social leader, not simply a task leader. It was important to her to be the social leader, to show everybody that she cares about them as human beings and cares about their families. So that has stuck with me for now, it's probably 35 years. Uh, she, did a, she did a phenomenal job. When I saw those things that she was doing, my, my immediate conclusion was this is so unusual and so rare in higher education. Peggy won't be with us long because she will be hired away. And she was with us for three or four years and then was hired to be the president of Akron University in Ohio. So hopefully that example, Peggy's example will stick with you. <clears throat> I was instructed by my colleague, dear colleague, Jaina, to finish a few minutes early to allow for questions and also allow for elevator speeches. So if, if I'm telling time accurately, I'm at 1.50. So I think I'm going to stop. I wish all of you <clears throat> good fortune with your business. I wish all of you good fortune as leaders of your business. Remember to lead by example. Be the task leader, but don't forget about the importance of being a social leader. Jaina, back to you. Thank you, Charlie. Great information. I hope everyone um, takes takes away and takes off on the social leadership side of things. It, you're right. It is so, so important. Uh, employees are not going to work for someone that they don't feel cares for them. I mean, that's right. the bottom line. So, right. or at least they won't be happy doing it. They'll always be looking for a way out. And looking for so, another job, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 